Dr. Uh, Camila Jackson. She is Deputy Chief Medical Officer and, uh, for Child and Adolescent Services, Community Behavioral Health, uh, and the Department of Behavioral Health and Intellectual Disability Services for the City of Philadelphia. Uh, in 2017, she was an appointee to the National Child Traumatic Stress Network Steering Committee. Uh, she is an alum of the Commonwealth Fund Morgan uh, Fellowship in Minority Health Policy, and she is also my co-fellow. I'm very proud to say that. And uh, I asked uh, Dr. Jackson the same question about her favorite teacher, and she said it was her English teacher in the seventh grade, Sister Helen. And the reason why is because she saw young minds to mold and not color. She uh, exposed the class to all manners of literature, uh, all forms of literature, um, and she taught her how to diagram a sentence, which she still knows how to do today. So with that, I will introduce Dr. Jackson. It's probably one of the nerdier responses, but I actually still do diagram sentences in my head when I'm trying to have my noun and verb agree with each other. Um, so I thank Sister Helen for that. Um, I'm really excited today for our panel um, and also just excited um, at the program today and looking at Thursday around oral health during our fellowship year. Uh, I had an orthodontist in our group as well, and our co-fellows would, would call us the mental dental folks um, and talk about the things that most people don't think about um, often until they have their own experiences or experiences with family members, et cetera. So really excited about the speakers today. Um, our first panelist is Dr. Matthew Birmingham. Dr. Birmingham is a child and adolescent psychiatrist and medical director of Children's Services at Roxbury. He graduated from Boston University School of Medicine and subsequently completed a combined residency in adult psychiatry and fellowship in child and adolescent psychiatry. He's the medical director of Children's Services for Roxbury and also has a private practice in Metro West, um, the Center for Wellbeing. The center is founded on the principle that peace and well-being are essential for all people in order to maintain a balanced life, a healthy environment, and a community without violence, conflict, and disease. He's also a consultant to the Department of Mental Health and Early Childhood Mental Health. He's a former psychiatrist for the Central Massachusetts Access uh, Region, where he was a consulting psychiatrist at Coordinated Family-Focused Care. He's a founder of the Haitian Mental Health Network, created in response to the 2010 earthquake in Haiti. Our second panelist is Dr. Sabra Katz-Weiss. Dr. Katz-Weiss is an assistant professor in adolescent and young adult medicine at Boston Children's Hospital and in pediatrics at Harvard Medical School. She trained in developmental psychology, gender and women's studies, and social epidemiology. Her research interests investigate sexual orientation and gender identity development, sexual fluidity, health disparities related to sexual uh, orientation and gender identity in adolescents and young adults, and psychosocial functioning in families with transgender youth. She's currently working on an NIH-funded community-based longitudinal mixed methods study to examine how the family environment affects the health and well-being of transgender youth. She's going to share some of those results with us today. And our final panelist is Dr. Janie Ward. Dr. Ward is a professor and chair of the Department of Education and chair of the Africana Studies Department at Simmons College in Boston. She is a co-editor of a few books, Mapping the Moral Domain, a Contribution of Women's Thinking to a Psychological Theory and Research. She also is a co-editor of a compilation of 16 autobiographical statements written by African-American, Caribbean, and Black Canadian college students in titles, entitled Souls Looking Back, Life Stories of Growing Up Black. And in uh, 2000, 2000, she also authored a book, The Skin We're In, Teaching Our Children to Be Emotionally Strong, Socially Smart, and Spiritually, spiritually Connected. For over 30 years, her professional work and research interests have centered on the developmental issues of African-American adolescents focusing on identity and moral development in African-American girls and boys. Along with her teaching responsibilities, she continues to work with youth counselors, secondary school educators, and other practitioners in a variety of settings. So that's our panelist today. Unfortunately, uh, our fourth panelist, um, Dr. Elliott, was not able to make it due to a family emergency last night. All right, so I'll introduce uh, Dr. Uh, Birmingham to come up. So I'm, I'm going to start where Nancy finished, where Dr. Rappaport finished, as well as where I hope to finish. But before we get there, we, we may hear things that may not be inspiring of hope. But I want to promise to you that the ultimate goal is to 
maintain, and maybe find a way to actualize hope. Um, as she said, the last slide, hope by uh, Sloan Coffin, William Sloan Coffin, the minister, Riverside Church in New York. Hope makes us persistent when we can't be optimistic, faithful when results elude us. You know, in preparing for this talk, I rewatched um, the James Baldwin documentary, I Am Not Your Negro. And um, there's a quotation in it where he says, um, uh, not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed that isn't faced. So I'd like us to start by thinking about things that we need to face with the ultimate goal of trying to change it. And I'm going to put it in the context of what my grandmother used to tell me growing up, and I didn't fully really understand it. She was you know, from Haiti, and she would say in French, those of you who may know French, la charité de norme. Let me put it in English, because not many people will understand. But great, um, what makes a man great is his kindness, his charity, and his compassion. Like charité de norme, fait un homme grand. I'm, I'm, I'm paraphrasing it. And I, in all my work, I've, been, I've thought more and more about this, because I think what she was also alluding to, and I've shared this with folks who've been involved in forensic psychiatry and psychology and, and the idea of what's happening in our country in terms of the mass incarceration, is if you want to tell the greatness of a nation, look in its prisons. And I'm amending it to say, if you want to see the greatness of how powerful a country really has become, look at how it treats its children and how they are held. And this conversation will be about what I've titled the preschool to prison pipeline. Some of you have heard about the, um, the um, school to prison pipeline. I want to mention a little bit about how this happens in preschool. Now, some of you have any, have, I'm, I wasn't sure how to prepare this talk because I wasn't sure my, what my audience would be like. But I would suspect that most of you have either even heard or seen uh, the documentary The 13th? May I see a show of hands? So a lot of what I'm going to say may be familiar to you, and I'm going to go over it very quickly. I'm just going to, although the United States is a fifth of the world's population, a quarter of the folks in prison are in the United States. And this um, graph here tells the story. You can see until the mid to late 70s, the early 80s, the rate of incarceration in this country was pretty steady. And then something happened in the late 80s, I mean late 70s, early 80s. Do you guys remember what happened? Exactly. There was the war on drugs, there was the tough on crime, and then subsequent to that, there was this theory of the broken glass theory in the last uh, 10, 15 years. And the idea is we need to be tough on crime. And one of the um, reasons why I think even the Democrats, and I'm not going to get too political, especially today, um, on how this happened. You guys remember the really Horton ad, right? Where uh, Dukakis was blamed for a, a uh, prisoner that was put on furlough, and then he ended up killing somebody. And so when Clinton ran for presidency, he wanted to be the opposite of the caucus by saying, um, I am tough on crime. I'm speaking to the people who helped design that program. That furlough program was actually very effective. And, and prisoners who, who participated in that program had a much less recidivism rate. But that was never talked about. And so we had the beginning of what I call the punitive definition of the criminal justice system, the idea that people go to jail to be punished and not, not rehabilitated. And that mentality has continued to the point where if you look at the rate of incarceration in this country, um, and I have another um, slide I, I won't have time to go into, but in summary, the United States 
um, in, in prisons, uh, for every 100,000 um, of a citizen, 670 um, are, are in, in incarceration. And if you were to separate, and this is a hard slide to see, but if you were to separate uh, states um, in terms of countries, you can see Louisiana, actually lately it's been the, the District of Columbia, is over uh, 1,000 per 100,000 are incarcerated. And uh, if you go to this slide online, what you'll see is that um, further down you have all the other countries. And it's a, it's, it's a really telling story. Now, it's not just the mass incarceration of a citizen. It's the disproportionate mass incarceration of a citizen. And although folks of color make up 30% of their population, they're over 60% of those incarcerated. And unfortunately, um, I'm going to skip to this. It begins in schools. And it begins in preschools. So I, I'm going to go very quickly um, to cover this. What we know is that children of color make up about 12 to 18 percent of children in the publicly funded preschools. Do you guys know what percentage of kids that are expelled from preschool are children of color? Almost 50 percent. Think about this. If we had almost 50% of our kids being expelled in preschool, that would be a national crisis. Unfortunately, it's thought to be the way our children are perceived. And it begins in preschool. What's unfortunate about that is that when children are, are expelled in preschool, they're significantly more likely to be expelled by the time they get to high school. And um, as a result, the majority of them end up in prison. So that's the school to prison pipeline, or the preschool to prison pipeline. I, um, I'm going to skip to a, um, I, I don't know if I'll be able to play this video, but this is a little video. And if we had more time, I would play it for you guys. It's a video of a, a, a four-year-old young lady being eventually arrested in class by the police. I don't know. Sure, let me try. Um, we'll take one second. Thank you for that. Um, it may take a few seconds. Have, have any of you seen this video? It was a young lady who was misbehaving in class, and the result was that the police, several policemen, were called into class to arrest her. Um, I. Uh, I'll tell you in a bit a story that happened in the preschool that I'm uh, involved in about a, a similar, o almost a similar instance in how we were able to change it. But what we know is Walter Gilliam, who's published um, a really interesting study looking at the rate of preschool expulsions, is that children um, in Massachusetts, we rated about ninth in the nation in the rate of preschool expulsions. And one of the reasons is because uh, preschools are not as regulated in terms of the guidelines for expulsions at, as the regular uh, kindergarten to 12th, but also because a lot of time parents are called then because the, the school doesn't know what to do to manage the behavior of a child. And uh, this, I won't have time to go into this particular um, the, the one drawback to being able to do this is... Should I go inside or no? She don't want anybody in there. Okay. You need to take I'm sorry that I, I'm trying to fast forward because I want to be sensitive to others' time. But eventually, she begins to lose self-regulation. The teacher is unable to manage her. And if I could fast forward the video, you would see that she, uh, police are called into the classroom. Um, and what it does is it sends the message that you are seen 
in a punitive way even at a very young age. Um, and what we know is that, I'm just going to fast forward to the next. Um, now to one. Um, it comes from this misunderstanding, in my mind, that um, behavior is all and be all of what we need to deal with when children are in our classroom. Those of us who work with kids in the caring professions know that from the majority of the time, the behavior is a way of the child to communicate. And our requirement, our job is to try to decipher and interpret what that behavior means. So often, though, that behavior is seen purely as an example of the child being a bad child. And we know that young children of color are seen in much more guilty ways, even at three to four years old. There have been studies, uh, Walter Gilliam did a study, you may have heard about this, where he asked preschool um, teachers to look at the classroom and try to identify the kids that would give you trouble so we can uh, maybe develop interventions um, to prevent them causing trouble in class. What the teachers didn't know is that their eyes were being um, scanned for who they would pay attention to the most. And for almost 50% 50, 50 of the time, the teachers focused on the young black males. This is in preschool. So we're, we have this implicit bias that identifies children, especially young children of color, as troublemakers. They internalize that. And often, they react to it um, without knowing what it is that they're reacting to. A few years ago, I got asked to evaluate a, uh, a mother and a child. She was 17 years old. And she wanted to um, ask me to write a letter in support of her having custody of her one-year-old child. And she was also in DCF custody. And um, as you guys may know, if you're in DCF custody and you have a child, your child becomes in DCF custody. So I was observing this mother, how she was interacting with this child. And he's one years old, and she was pushing him away. And he started crying, and she uh, avoided hugging him. And I, and I asked her, help me understand what's going on. Well, I'm toughening him up, because it's a tough world out there. And it struck me that by the age of one, this young man was beginning to learn that when I cry, I won't get hugged. When I hurt, I won't be embraced. Because that's what's going to make me tough. A few years after that, not far from here, there's a group called um, Smart from the Start. It's another group that works with uh, helping really young children in the development housing. And there was a, uh, a shootout outside. And the three to four year olds all ran to where the shooting occurred. And there was one of them who was like, let me at, let me at it. I'm not afraid. And it, it really caused us a lot of um, curiosity, because what he was doing was reacting to something dangerous, skipping over the freeze or the flight, but going straight to the fight. And I would say that that's one of the greatest troubles that we have. And I'm speaking to those of us in the community of color. Some of you may have seen this, this, this article in the New York Times um, in March by Stacey Part um, Parton. Have you guys seen it? It's a really good article. I recommend it. She talks about the high rate of corporal punishment in the African American community. And that started after we moved here from Africa. Because in Africa, we didn't use corporal punishment as the main mechanism of disciplining our children. So the idea of seeing our children in punitive ways is not just something that our kids need to deal with by forces outside the community, but as well in the community. So where is the hope? Well, the hope is this. Um, we do know what helps children do well. It's being in a supportive in environment where they're cared for. Instead of pushing the child away, hug him. It also is an environment that helps the child develop self-efficacy self and perceive control, and also providing opportunities to strengthen adoptive skills, especially skills of self-regulation, and then mobilize resources of, such as faith, hope, and a cultural tradition. So I'm going to end with what uh, James Baldwin said is the future of the, at that time, the Negro in this country is precisely related to the future of this country. And as he said, 
to paraphrase, we need to figure out how to, improve, how to embrace, accept, and celebrate the foreign among us, those that we too often look at and use the N-word against. Today, the N-word may not be used to describe folks who are of African or even Latino descent. Now we're using it for those who are of a certain religious background, the Muslims. And I think his question to us is still ringing in my ear today, is why do we have to have a N-word? Why do we need to have it? So we actually have a little bit of time. What we're going to do is take one to two questions for the specific panelist, and then we'll open up at the end of all three for larger discussion. So any any questions for Dr. Birmingham specifically? Sure. I guess, yeah, the microphone might be better. Sophia Moras, I'm a child psychiatrist at McLean, and I'm really curious about what is being done or what could be done to change the narrative um, in terms of people of color, specifically because, yes, there are lots of great strategies that we can do in terms of imploring the clinicians and the teachers in how they can respond to children, but I'm really curious about how kids are being perceived and what we are what we can do as clinicians or politicians in terms of sensitizing the people who are actually interacting with those children so that they're not perceived as older than their age, they're not constantly perceived as threats. Because I imagine that no matter what we do in terms of helping those interactions interpersonally in a very small scale, that in the larger system, we're not really changing the narrative. That invariably, when people come across a four-year-old they might see him as seven or eight, and when they come across a 12-year-old, he's perceived as an adult. My fear is that if that narrative doesn't change, we will constantly be fighting an uphill battle. I can mention what I think should happen and what I hope will eventually happen. It may sound a little Pollyannish to, to suggest this, but I don't know of another solution. I think what's happened with the way that we treat children specifically and children of color more specifically is the result of a philosophy that has been creeping up in the past maybe 50 to 60 years. And it's one that looks at people not as human beings that need to be treated with, with respect and compassion, but with suspicion, with anger, with distrust, and with a, a sense of punitive attitude because of their behaviors. So the first thing is really to go back to this notion of seeing humans as humans. Because slavery in all forms of, 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 uh, of inhumanity towards other humans is because we somehow, and you know, we did it in the Constitution, we, we define humans as less than humans. And if that's where you begin, the result is that you will continue to have policies, perceptions, and practices that dehumanize humans. And if you have a child, he's going to be treated less than human. So that's, 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 that's the big picture. And the reason I'm thinking about hope is because I think our country is trying this experiment of being angry with each other. I think eventually it's going to have to peter out or we're going to destroy ourselves. So I'm hopeful, like James Baldwin said, I'm alive, so I, I'm forced to have hope that we'll realize that we can have that attitude towards each other as well as towards our children. So that's the first. There are signs of hope. What Walter Gilliam talked about is the school consulting program that's been shown to reduce the rate of, of preschool expulsions with kids who participate in that program. Almost 97% 97 of them were not expelled. So there are programs out there that have been shown to be successful in helping children remain in school. But it's a really, I wish I had time to go into the story that I wanted to share with you guys. But even in the preschool where I worked, there was a young man having trouble. And to make a long story short, he was about to be kicked out. I came, I spent time with him. By the end of that session, he was helping me clean up the mess that he made. 
This is, this is a young man whose mother had to be kicked out of several shelters because of his behaviors. She had to lose several jobs because she kept having to go to preschool because he was being asked to leave. And yet, I, it took a little bit of understanding and a recognition that he's a human being that needs to be treated like a human being. So I, ultimately, I think that's the general idea. There are specific examples of programs that have been shown to be helpful. I'm also a, 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 a big advocate of teaching children mindfulness, because I really believe that we should have reading, writing, arithmetic, and self-regulation. And teaching children how to regulate themselves, to me, is crucial to social and emotional development. And there are programs out there that have been shown to be very effective in doing so. Hi everyone, I'm Sabra Katzweiz. I'm going to be talking with you today about LGBTQ youth development and health, and specifically about the protective role of family. So to get us started, and to make sure that everyone's on the same page with terminology, um, I'm going to review a little bit. Um, so LGBTQ is an umbrella term that refers to sexual and gender minorities. It stands for lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer or questioning, but also includes a lot of other terms, including intersex, asexual, and many, many other identities. Um, the gender unicorn is a useful tool to help us understand how gender and sexual orientation are different aspects of the self. So in this graphic, gender identity refers to how someone understands themselves to be a boy, girl, both, or neither. Gender expression refers to how someone shows their gender to other people through their behavior or appearance. Sex assigned at birth refers to the sex that a person is given at the time of birth, whether that be female, male, or intersex. And these aspects are also separate from sexual orientation or the attraction that someone feels for other people. We can think about different gender identities as being um, crossed between sex assigned at birth and gender identity. So as an example, someone who was assigned female at birth and now identifies as a girl or woman would be a cisgender girl or cisgender woman. Someone who is assigned a female sex at birth and identifies as a boy or man might be transmasculine or a trans boy or a trans man. And people can also be assigned either female or male at birth and have a gender identity that is both boy, or, boy and girl, neither boy nor girl, somewhere outside of, um, outside of the binary. And some of the identities that people might use are non-binary, gender queer, and gender non-conforming. But there are a lot of other um, terms that people use as well. We can think of sexual orientation as comprising three primary dimensions. Um, identity, which is the labels that someone uses to describe their sexual orientation to themselves or others, the romantic and sexual attractions that a person has for other people, as well as the sex or gender of their sexual partners. And these three different components of sexual orientation may or may not be consistent within an individual person. So someone might identify their sexual orientation as a lesbian, they might be a cisgender girl who identifies as a lesbian and has attractions to boys as well. So these things might not necessarily be aligned um, as we would assume. And it's also important to think about how sexual orientation and gender identity might intersect with other identities, such as race, ethnicity, socioeconomic status, age, immigration status, ability status, um, to produce unique experiences. So if we think about the example of a white, gay, cisgender adult man versus a black, bisexual, adolescent, transgender girl, these two individuals are going to have drastically different life experiences, even though they could both be encompassed within the LGBTQ umbrella. Um, in terms of LGBTQ identity development, everyone develops a gender identity and a sexual orientation. Gender identity typically develops in early childhood, whereas sexual orientation typically develops during adolescence. And gender identity and sexual orientation may also be fluid across the lifespan, but particularly among youth and especially during childhood and adolescence. These different identities also develop within a number of different contexts. So the family context, the community context, and the larger societal and historic context. 
And these contexts are really important in thinking about how individuals within the LGBTQ community are perceived out in the world and within their families, as well as the kinds of support and resources that they have access to. There's a growing body of research um, that indicates that LGBTQ youth have worse health outcomes than cisgender heterosexual youth across numerous different areas. So within, and this is, this is just a, an example, there's a lot of other research out there, but these are some of, the, some of the things that people have found. So within physical health, there are disparities in terms of chronic pain, um, overweight BMI status, teen pregnancy, STIs and HIV. In terms of mental health, um, there are disparities in depression, anxiety, self-harm, and suicidality. And in terms of health risk behaviors, there have been demonstrated disparities in unhealthy eating behaviors and substance use. And across the, ma the majority of these outcomes, um, LGBTQ youth fare worse than cisgender heterosexual youth. Minority stress theory can be helpful in conceptualizing why these disparities might be occurring. This theory proposes that there are both distal stressors, so stressors that are external to a person, such as experiences of prejudice and discrimination, as well as proximal stressors, so the internalization of stigma associated with that prejudice and discrimination, and that these different types of stressors adversely affect both physical and mental health, in part via, via a psychological stress response. And we can apply this specifically to LGBTQ youth in thinking about how experiences of LGBTQ-related prejudice and discrimination and internalized homophobia, biphobia, and transphobia adversely affect physical and mental health. And it's important to remember that these distal, stre distal stressors may be overt, um, such as verbal harassment or physical violence, but they can also be subtle in the form of microaggressions. In terms of distal stressors, um, we have quite a bit of evidence that LGBTQ youth experience a lot of harassment at school. Um, the, this graph was taken from the National School Climate Survey that was conducted in 2015 by GLSEN. And you can see that um, LGBTQ youth experienced a lot of different types of harassment. So verbal harassment, physical harassment, related to either their sexual orientation or their gender identity, electronic harassment, and sexual harassment. In terms of proximal stressors, youth may internalize LGBTQ-related prejudice, leading to a number of different adverse outcomes, including decreased sense of self-worth, self-medication and substance abuse, shame, risk-taking behavior, and depression and suicidality. And if we think specifically about transgender youth, which is the population that I'm going to talk a little bit more toward the end of this presentation, compared to cisgender youth, transgender youth have higher rates of depression, anxiety, suicidality, self-harm, and use of inpatient and outpatient mental health services. And these adverse mental health outcomes have largely been attributed to minority stress within the framework that I shared with you earlier, as well as a lack of family support. There are a number of different protective factors for LGBTQ youth, and one of them is social support from different sources. So we can think about social support from peers, from family, which is what I'm going to focus on today, school, such as anti-bullying policies, um, community, as well as society, um, such as legal protections for LGBTQ individuals. And it's also important to remember that either these each of these factors can be either a source of support or a source of stigma for youth. So this brings us to the project that I'm working on currently, which is the Trans Teen and Family Narratives Project. This is a study um, that aims to understand the effects of the family environment on transgender youth's health and well-being over time. This study uses a community-based participatory research approach, which involves the community in each step of the research process as much as possible. Um, it has a mixed methods design with surveys and interviews and is longitudinal with five waves across two years. So we're currently collecting data for wave three in this study, um, which is the one year follow up. Um, but I'll be talking today about data from wave one, which was the baseline. The sample in this project is 33 families with 96 family members. Um, 
with 33 transgender youth ages 13 to 17 years, 48 cisgender caregivers, and 15 cisgender siblings. Families were recruited from multiple sources across New England to obtain diverse range of experiences and family functioning. And all, fam all family members completed an in-person qualitative interview and survey at Wave 1. And I'm going to talk about some of the survey data with you. In terms of sample characteristics, um, in terms of gender identity specifically, transgender youth were 36% transfeminine, 52% transmasculine, and 12% non-binary. Caregivers were 67% cisgender women, which were primarily mothers, but we had a couple of grandmothers in the sample, and 33 cisgender men, which were fathers. And then the siblings were 47% cisgender girls and 53% cisgender boys. In terms of race ethnicity, 73% of the youth and siblings were white, and 92% of the caregivers were white. 40% uh, of the caregivers had a master's degree or higher. And 85% of families lived in a metropolitan region, although we did have um, families from across New England in non-metropolitan areas as well. In terms of analyses, we conducted descriptive statistics to describe transgender youth's mental health in this sample and linear regression models to test the associations of different family members' perspectives of family functioning and transgender youth's mental health. In terms of family functioning, we looked specifically at the quality of family communication and family satisfaction, and the models were all adjusted for transgender youth's age and gender identity. <coughs> this table shows the uh, descriptive results for suicidality among the trans youth in the sample. And you can see that 30% of the trans youth reported having suicidal thoughts, 24% reported having a suicide plan at some point, 15% had actually attempted suicide, and 15% had also been hospitalized for suicide. In terms of self-harm, 49% of the trans youth in the sample had reported lifetime self-harm. 17% of the caregivers had reported that they had a trans youth with a self-injury disorder diagnosis. 61% of trans youth in the sample had a clinically significant depression symptom score. 40% of caregivers reported that, they, that their trans youth had a depression diagnosis. Um, the anxious symptoms were on the higher end of the scale. And 48% uh, of caregivers reported that they had a child with an anxiety disorder diagnosis. So I wanted to understand how family functioning might be related to transgender youth's mental health in this population. So we looked at whether um, different family members' reports of family communication predicted transgender youth's mental health. And we found that the trans youth's report of quality of family communication significantly predicted a number of health outcomes. So trans youth who reported better family communication reported lower depressive symptoms, lower anxious symptoms, and higher self-esteem and higher resiliency. And the caregiver report of family communication was not significantly related to the trans youth's mental health. Similarly, we looked at whether um, different family members' reports of family satisfaction predicted trans youth's mental health and added a sibling report here. And we found that trans youth who reported higher family satisfaction were less likely to engage in self-harm had lower depression and anxious symptoms, and higher self-esteem. Um, but the associations were not significant for the caregiver or sibling reports. So to summarize, transgender youth in this sample have alarming rates of mental health concerns, which is pretty consistent with other research um, on transgender youth, by the way. Um, better family functioning was associated with better mental health outcomes among transgender youth which really speaks to the protective role of family in these youth's lives. And significant associations were found for transgender youth's own report of family functioning, but not for caregivers' or siblings' reports, which suggests that different family members are perceiving family functioning differently, and that the trans youth's own um, perception of family functioning might be what's most important to pay attention to. Some of the clinical implications from this work um, and from what I shared with you earlier, is the importance of assessing support networks for LGBTQ youth, particularly the family, involving the whole family in LGBTQ youth's care, but also paying special attention to the youth's own, own perspective of family functioning, connecting families to community resources that specifically serve families with LGBTQ youth, 
And um, we need to develop more family level interventions for these families to make sure that the family is a supportive environment for LGBTQ youth. Uh, so I wanted to quickly acknowledge the funders and many different people have worked who have worked on this project. Um, these are the resources that I gave that should be in your packets for today. Um, thank you. I'm interested in the distinction between the parents and the siblings' perception of the, their response and the, the youth's perception. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'd like to hear a little more about that. Yeah, so um, I want to say first that this, because this is a longitudinal study and I've spent the past year or so just collecting, collecting, collecting data, so I'm just getting into the analysis a little bit, so this is kind of the first pass of the analysis. Um, so I, I know enough to say that their perceptions are different. So the youth's perception of family functioning, the caregiver's perception, and the sibling's perception were not significantly correlated with each other, um, which was kind of a surprise to me, actually. But I don't know yet which directions they were in. So I don't know if caregivers were perceiving family functioning better than the youth were. I'm not exactly sure yet. Um, I think what's going to be interesting is that we're assessing family functioning at each of the waves, so I'm, I'm curious to see for myself how things might end up changing over time. A lot of the youth in the sample are at different stages of transitioning their gender, um, and that's causing a lot of uh, upheaval and change within the family, and so I'm, I think there will be a lot to see as, as we look across time longitudinally. Great. Can Thank you. you. Oh, sure. <laughs> what about five waves? So I know the first year and then the follow up. Yeah, so the five waves are six every six months across two years. So we're in the middle of wave three, which is the one year follow up, and then we have two more waves to go. So. I think you said eighty five to ninety percent of your um, uh, study participants are in urban areas. Um, can you talk about why? Yeah, definitely. I think it's um, essentially because there's more support and resources for families with transgender youth in urban areas. Um, there's a big lack of access to gender affirming medical care in particular in rural areas. So a lot of families move to more urban areas so that they can um, get care for their kids. Yeah. Yeah, I just had a quick question regarding um, the break, the racial breakdown of the sure. sample size. Can you speak to um, if it was seventy three percent white, the remaining twenty seven percent racial breakdown? Yeah, so it's it was seventy three three percent white among the youth in the families, but the caregivers were I think ninety two percent white. So the other youth were mixed race ethnicity, I believe. Um, some of the youth in the sample are adopted, so that accounts for the discrepancy between the youth and caregivers. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to start with um, a very short anecdote that comes from a situation comedy that was on a couple of weeks ago. I imagine I might be in an audience where you don't spend a lot of time looking at sitcoms, but this one was on a TV show called uh, Brooklyn 9-11. It's um, a show about a group of policemen um, at a police precinct. And in this show, there are two um, young cops who are dating each other, and um, they are white. They work for um, a supervisor, you know, a captain who is black. His wife is out of town. He has to do something, um, and he needs a babysitter for his six-year-old twins. The two uh, cops, a man and a woman, the young white cops, volunteer to babysit. Um, a scene before... Uh, uh, this event is that the f uh, when the kids are in the car, one of them accidentally loses her binky, um, which goes flying out the car, and now the, the child can't go to sleep because she needs her binky. So dad has to go outside and look around on the ground to see if he can find the binky. He's outside. Uh, unfortunately, so is another white cop who does not know him, 
sees him in this middle class neighborhood and asks him, what is he doing there? Um, the black cop tries to explain what's happening. Um, the situation quickly escalates and he is, bam, slammed on the car, um, handcuffed. Okay, so now the next scene is um, the two young white cops are babysitting the six-year-old twins. And one of them asks, what happened with daddy? Is it, uh, did he get in trouble? Is it because he's black? Well, the two white cops look at each other and have one of those deer in the headlight moments. And they say to the child, uh, we'll be right back. And they run into the kitchen. And then there's this interaction. What do we do? What do we say? Oh my God, do, uh, should we be honest? I think we should be, no, we can't be honest. That'll be really awful, that'll scare them. No, what do we do? And, uh, and oh, this is so stressful, I can't take it anymore. Let's just leave. And the other one goes, we can't leave, we're babysitting. Okay. Now, I was trained as an applied developmental psychologist, and when I was in graduate school, there was no talk about race, and especially not about racism when it came to child development. The focus, when it existed, was largely on racial disparities, comparisons. But there was very little focus on the specific developmental needs of black children and the cultural context of black child development. Talk about race was thought to result in demoralizing kids, destroying their innocence, spoiling their childhood, turning them into victims. When anyone referred to the talk, what they were talking about was sex. Today, however, the talk is about a whole lot more than sex. In the Black Lives Matter age of racial profiling, rising police brutality, and the very visible, high-profile, and media-saturated deaths of Trayvon Martin, Michael Brown, and Eric Garner, among many others, and the increased attention to racial inequality in the U.S. criminal justice system. That has had many Americans, especially black American families, talking to their children about what they're hearing and seeing on TV and in social media. Race is the topic of the day. But black folks have always been talking about race with their children, way before the Black Lives Matter movement. Research, including my own, has documented the ways in which talk about race has served as anticipatory socialization. Black folks know that to be forewarned is to be prepared. The preparation for bias is about giving kids the tools to navigate inequalities. Researchers suggest that children benefit academically, behaviorally, and cognitively when parents are explicit in teaching them to prepare for racial hostilities and to be proud of their cultural uh, cultures. Now, uh, I want to make two points before I begin. One is that I know that black folks are not a monolith in this country. Not all black, uh, all black people um, come from that southern black American experience of having slavery in our backgrounds. We have many Caribbean, West Indian black folks, many Afri people who, Africans, um, and from other parts of the world, right? So we go, when we go into our black communities, they are increasingly diverse. However, the one thing that they do share is the color of their skin and the assumptions that are made about them before they open their mouth and an accent comes out or um, some, something else that marks them as different. The second thing is that what I'm going to be talking to you about primarily today comes from my interest in focusing on a strengths perspective. I think it's really important for us to identify all the things that go wrong, but I think it's equally important for us to talk about when things are going right. Um, and so some of, this, uh, some of these ideas that I'm going to share with you come from research that focuses on um, what's going on in black fam healthy black families um, uh, in which um, 
kids are being um, raised in ways that are preparing them for what they have to deal with uh, as adults. So in many healthy black families, one and two parent families, ones with mothers and other mothers and whoever those adults are who are providing a nurturing environment for their children, they feel that it is their responsibility to teach their children to identify obstacles to positive development, especially the isms. So here um, uh, I'm talking about racism, sexism, sometimes social class bias, uh, and see that they are embedded in their cultural contexts and how these powerful negative effects can derail black children, youth, families, and communities at the individual, the institutional, and systemic levels. In so doing, parents and other supportive adults in the lives of black children develop children's capacities to generate internal strategies to resist the negative effects of racial and gender and class bias that, and do so in ways that are safe, that are creative, and that are effective. And the parents who are most successful at this are those who address these issues in ways that are developmentally and age appropriate. So let's talk really quickly about um, what's going on in um, the minds of children um, as we go through early childhood into adolescence um, related to the development of racial awareness. So in early childhood, psychologists have learned a great deal about how children develop their attitudes about racial difference. In the first years of life, toddlers develop the ability to recognize racial differences. They can label those differences, and they categorize themselves within a racial group. During the preschool years, children learn to classify, and they tend to do this based on color and size. Now, preschool-age children are really curious about everything, they, especially differences. They want to understand how people got their color, how they got their hair texture, um, or their eye shape. They're curious, yes, but as we know, sometimes their thinking is still a little limited, sometimes it's distorted, and very often it is inconsistent. Psychologists have shown that at this age, it's easy for children to behave and to believe stereotypes and to form prejudices. So girls do this, boys do that. If you don't believe it, go into Toys R Us and see the Mattel pink and blue, right? White people do this, black people do that. By first grade, most kids are able to develop a racial <clears throat> orientation, which includes positive and negative attitudes towards members of certain races. In fact, when you give children cards uh, with pictures of children to sort any way that they want, 13% of six-year-olds will sort by gender, but 68% of them sort by race. Now, many of you know or you've heard of uh, the Clark Doll studies, right? Somewhat problematic uh, research, but if anything, it has shown us that um, uh, both white and black children in this country internalize a white bias early in their lives. Children figure out who is and who isn't valued or preferred in this culture. In the middle uh, childhood years, that's when kids are developing a sense of competency and mastery. Um, it's also when kids are really focused on peer groups and um, social comparison. So am I good enough? Um, am I as good as another kid? Lots of kids are really good at lots of different things. Uh, sometimes it's schoolwork, sometimes it's athletics or relationships. But uh, there are an awful lot of kids out there who are feeling inferior, that they are not good at something. And this can be particularly problematic when they associate the not being good at something with their racial identity, who they are. 
So we know from uh, research that for too many of those kids, it becomes extremely problematic when they become aware and of and believe the stereotypes out there about academic ability, that some groups are more intelligent than other groups, and they start to disassociate from school on the basis of race. Race is not for me or for people who look like me. So the intersections of racial identity um, and uh, academic ability, we really start to see kick in in middle childhood. Now, when we get to adolescence, of course, the name of the game is all about social comparison, peer acceptance, balancing expectations of self and other. And as Eric Erickson said, would say, this is the time of the real work of identity formation. Who am I? Where do I belong? The new research on intersectionality, as Sabra had mentioned, calls our attention to the fact that identity is occurring uh, uh, across a number of different realms. Racial identity, gender identity, sexual orientation, social class, ability. And um, intersectionality allows us to ask the questions about in which ways are what, could one identity be advantaged while another identity possessed by the same person may have uh, caused reasons for disadvantage, right? Um, but we do know that uh, identity construction can be particularly difficult when kids see themselves as different, stigmatized, um, or marginalized. Here I have um, areas that psychologists are working on now related to racial identity and black kids in particular, stereotype threat and its relationship to academic achievement. Um, when kids start to, uh, the, when kids are at the risk of confirming um, as a self characteristic, a negative stereotype about one's group. And we know that the research is out there that says that when, um, uh, when kids uh, become so, worried that you're going to imagine me in a particular way that might be different the way I see myself, my uh, achievement is going to be affected by that. Children's perceptions of discrimination. Uh, a big study was done UCLA and the RAND Corporation, over 5,000 children, fifth grade, and found that um, uh, the majority of children reported perceptions of discrimination, that they feel like other people don't like them or other people are treating them unfairly, okay? And we also know lots of studies with adolescents suggest that um, kids are walking around feeling like um, they are just not fitting in. So these perceptions of discrimination are directly tied to symptoms like depression and lowered self-esteem. Lastly, microaggressions right now are a really hip term. A lot of people are doing a lot of research, not just in African-American communities, but in other ethnic communities as well. Microaggressions are those subtle comments that um, we can receive, like, uh, oh my god, you're so articulate for a black person. Okay, is that a comment or what, right? Or one I just heard earlier um, this week from a student. Uh, that paper is so good, I didn't know it was written by a black person. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, racial identity, uh, lots of research out there, and it talks about the fact that um, uh, research suggests that positive racial and ethnic identity promotes self-esteem. It serves as a buffer against acts of bias. It promotes psychological well-being and reduces stress-related symptoms, particularly depression and anxiety. And in some studies, it's directly related to academic performance and indirectly related to academic achievement. So there are lots of good reasons why we should be promoting positive racial identity in children. I want to say really quickly the importance of ethnic pride. And it's not just about teaching children their history, their heritage, 
or talking about cultural achievements, because too often they don't get that in our uh, school system. But it's also about helping children to remember that we are, we as a people, as in black folks, are on an upward social trajectory. It's sometimes it may not feel that way. Um, however, when you compare where we were as a people 100, 200 years ago, hell, 50 years ago, we are doing much better. And it's really important for children to remember that we are, um, that things are getting better. Okay, research has also documented associations among different social, uh, racial socialization messages and important outcomes, including, as I have up here, more mature identity development, higher levels of self-esteem, reduced problem behaviors, better academic adjustment, reduced acculturative stress, and increased resilience. OK, lastly, because I um, uh, am in and out of schools and working with uh, youth counselors and people who work with children, everybody always, and a lot of these folks are white um, or not black. Uh, everybody's always asking me, okay, so how do you have these conversations with kids? And I just want to um, give you a couple of suggestions. One is you always need to think and teach about race in developmentally and age-appropriate ways. You do it in ways in which kids can hear you, okay? You don't give them more than they can handle, right? And you also don't talk down to them. Second, the more you talk, the better you get at it. So those first few conversations could feel really tough and confusing and make, might make you want to feel like those two cops on the sitcom. Where's the door? I want to get out of here. But you got to keep at it. Third, it's really important to acknowledge the existence of um, prejudice, racism, and discrimination. You can't attack the problem unless you're willing to name the problem. Similarly, it's really important for us to explain and define racism, prejudice, discrimination, and bigotry. There are a lot of um, definitions out there, some of them competing with each other. And sometimes kids get confused about uh, you know, what is and what is not um, racism, for example. I believe it's really important um, for us to talk and create together with children a repertoire of responses to racial discrimination. You have to co-construct these strategies. Kids know the social dynamics of their lives sometimes a whole lot better than we do. We have to learn from kids. We have to work with them. And you notice I say a repertoire of responses. You can't respond to every situation in the exact same way. You've got to give kids uh, you know, a, a host of tools that they can draw from, helping them to see when it's time, when it works to do this, and when it works to do that. Um, consume media images critically. There are a lot of images out there um, uh, about black folks or brown folks. Some of them are getting better, but there's an awful lot of funky stuff that's out there. Um, and it's important, especially when you look at the intersection of race and gender. And it's really important for us to talk with kids about media images um, that they are consuming. As I had said, promote ethnic pride. And then lastly, do the work. Educate yourself. If you don't know what's happening in the lives of kids of color, talk to kids. Watch what they watch. Listen to what they're listening to. And most important, understand what you bring to the table. Your racial and gender identity, your unconscious biases. What do you need to let go of? And what do you need to learn more about? Okay. Thank you. So thank you very much, Dr. Ward, for Hi. your talk. My name is Andrew Sanderson. I'm uh, at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Mm -hmm. uh, very interested, uh, as a father of four, in what you mentioned with uh, stereotype threat, uh, internalized racism, 
And when you have affirming conversations, what is the dose response that you've seen in research? So these kids have been bombarded with stereotypes, negative stereotypes in all different situations. Mm -hmm. um, how much um, talking, uh, affirming conversations, historical examples of achievement are necessary to, to balance out what they're seeing on a daily basis? So I think that there, I think um, families do it in a variety of different ways. Um, there are some parents who take a, um, an approach that uh, goes across the child, you know, the lifespan of the child. So they may start when children are very, very little. And um, uh, so I love to tell this story about the mom who, when she's braiding her daughter's hair, she's sitting there combing her hair, and she's talking about how beautiful she is. And she's talking about how beautiful her child's hair is. And see what happens when we put, your, we put these barrettes in your hair, and it looks so pretty. And your hair looks just like mommy's hair and just like grandma's hair. And the idea is what, what she's doing now is that she is giving her daughter the tools of self-love. And the mother specifically said, I am doing this because I know that when she becomes a teenager and she's bombarded with all those commercials about, uh, you know, bouncing and behaving hair and makeup because there's something wrong with you the way you look, that child is, it, you know, her sense of who she is is going to be shaken. And so I want to give her a rock, holler, a rock solid um, start from the beginning. Um, now, as kids get a little bit older and they are dealing with stuff in school, the parents who take the life-long um, uh, approach would say, then you have conversations about um, uh, if you want to emphasize uh, uh, achievements, you talk about all of those black folks who have done incredible things. And what are you learning in school? Have they talked to you about Rosa Parks? Have they talked to you about Frederick Douglass? Have they, you know, uh, taking kids to see... Hidden, um, hidden figures, and talking about not only what the story that occurred in the movie that is so beautifully predicted, but why is it that we don't know about the accomplishments of those women? So there are ways in which um, things that are happening in a child's life can jumpstart conversations about race, right? Now, then there are other parents who don't say anything until there's a crisis, OK? Um, Personally, I think that that's a little bit more problematic, but it's still, it's better than not saying anything at all, right? So, it, so there are lots of different um, places where you can enter the conversation. Um, and I think that in healthy families, they're always sort of looking for, when can I say something, right? When can I, at least if nothing else, ask the kid, what do you know? And where did you learn this? Hello. Um, hi. Yeah, I'm from Milwaukee, and there's an article, the March 23rd Milwaukee Journal article, that talked about a generational cycle of poverty and trauma in terms of the inner city, and um, race plays a role of it, according to the article. And mm -hmm. they emphasize that uh, the American Psychiatric Association, that some of these individuals or many should be referred to psychiatrists. And I'm a general internist, so I refer people all the time. And Basically, I'm 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 curious whether you, you know, what, even in your old child or some other child, where you would say, you know, this is beyond what I can do as a parent, and I should have this child see a psychiatrist. Oh, without a doubt, um, without a doubt. I um, but I think that not but, and I think that. Uh, Parents who are talking with their children about what we adults consider sort of sensitive issues, right? And whether it's sexual orientation, whether it's racial identity, whether it's immigrant status, 
I think that the parents who are close to their children and having these conversations will be the parent who is better able to see that something's not clicking here and that maybe I do need to get help from somebody else to help me to navigate this journey, right? So, so I would never say that um, the parents can solve all problems all by themselves, right? Um, I wish that were true, but I know that ain't even true in my own family, right? <laughs> but I would also say that as we reach out to the professionals, I want our professionals to be trained to have these conversations. And I want our professionals not to um, be so filled with anxiety that they are afraid to have these conversations. And that's one of the things that just, uh, you know, blocks us from doing the kind of work that we need to do. Right? Let it go. Let it go and talk honestly with kids. And even if you're afraid to, uh, about what's going to come out of your mouth, ask questions. Teenagers love to talk. Just keep asking them questions and build rapport. And eventually, hopefully, your anxiety will go down. And then maybe you can actually engage in a dialogue. I want to thank our panelists today. I think each could have a separate talk on their own uh, about their specific areas. But I think there were some really undergirding themes throughout um, about the importance of development, and particularly with kids, child development, and their tasks at each stage and where it can go off course and where they may need some support. Um, also around context, um, thinking in particular about the, the picture of the brain actually that Dr. Rappaport sh shared earlier, we're learning more and more about um, how experiences and environment also shape brain development, um, and so really critical to keep that in mind. Um, and then certainly the importance of buffers and protective factors, in particular caring adults, as Dr. Birmingham <coughs> shared, and families um, and the supportive function that they can play. Um, for me, in my context, it's interesting, and I think this theme is played out and important for this panel, is it's not just around thinking about referrals to professionals. There are things that each of us can do as adult in our, adults in our interactions with children based on an understanding of development and needs and opportunities for support. Um, and I think as we talk later in the afternoon about schools and particular focusing there, um, even more critical to bring some of this knowledge out into our general public so that people know more about what they're doing in terms of their interactions with kids and how to help them keep them on a normal trajectory. Um, so I'm going to stop here. We actually have maybe five minutes for questions, it looks like, in general of any of the panelists. <laughs> I guess the elephant in the room for me is I thought we were making some progress, maybe not perfect, but I wonder from each of your perspectives how this current political climate has changed the landscape from your perspectives. I can go first. Sure. I can go first. Um, so I can say within the LGBTQ community, the change in administration has created a lot of fear. Um, and that there have been a lot of reports um, about increased discrimination experiences um, since there's been a change in administration. And specifically with families with transgender youth, there has been a, a big rush to get legal documents changed as soon as possible, um, such as name changes, gender markers on identity documents and things like that. Um, and to get youth access and plugged into gender-affirming services as soon as possible because we don't know when those might go away. Uh, I would add that, um, uh, so I've been doing this for a long time, and often when I talk about African-American families, previously um, folks would come up to me afterwards and they might say, well, I adopted a little black kid and they want to, talk about things. Um, you know, white folks would come up to me. 
what I'm hearing now since the election of the new administration is um, that professional people of color who are not of African descent, so they may be Indian, they may be Asian, are coming up and wanting to talk about identity issues because their children are coming home and, and saying, are we going to be deported, right? And what is all this talk about X, Y, and Z? And even though the parents may say, what do you mean deported? We're not going anywhere. You know, we've been here and, uh, you know, I have a job. I'm a doctor here. You know, you're not going anywhere. The kids are still very anxious and are confused. And the parents ha are wondering, how do I talk about these issues in the context that of, uh, you know, the suburban middle class environments in which my kids are growing up? So in that sense, I think that uh, the current um, climate is forcing us to talk in ways that we had not before. And I think as you mentioned, we've come a long way. Mm -hmm. So I'm reminded by the, you know, the quotation for, of Martin Luther King that the arc of the mall universe is long, but it bends towards justice. And that's a faith statement as well as a hope statement that becomes a reality. It's incredible what we've done within our lifetime. And I see racism and a lot of these issues as an illness that has responded initially to the treatment, but the treatment needs to be continued. It's as if you're treating an, an infection and after the first three days you feel good, so you think you can stop the medicine. I really think that what's happening now may be a reaction to th this initial success that we had with the election of a black president and the thought that it would be somewhat over now that we've accomplished this milestone. But to me, what it speaks to, and I'm not surprised by this, is how entrenched some of these misconceptions about each other resides in the human heart. And so I'm not discouraged because I never expected it to be easy. <laughs> Right? And it's almost like you watch one of these movies where the villain just is about to die, but just before they die, there's a last gasp. <laughs> right? And um, I think it will bend towards justice. It's just it's a long arc. And that means we can't re rest on our laws and say, you know what, we've accomplished, so now we can rest. Mm -hmm. If anything, it's, it's reminding us that you, you have to remain forever vigilant and hopeful. Because these are the kind of things that you, you can't take for granted. And that's what I'm hopeful, because I think our youth will begin this conversation. The other thing that you said, which was really wonderful, I think we need to listen to our children and understand that they're trying to speak to us. Uh, Jimi Hendrix said, wisdom, knowledge speaks, but wisdom listens. And I think this is an invitation to listen. Um, that's where I find my hope, because you know, I'm interpreting this last election as an attempt to be heard. Mm -hmm. People were not listening. Somebody claimed to have been listening, and they ran to that person who thought they thought understood them. But now we realize that's not really what happens. I'm sorry, I'm taking sides on this one, right? <laughs> um, I just don't see the evidence to support that the person who told them that I, I feel your pain feels their pain. Right? I just don't see the evidence yet. Maybe in another year, two, four. But we know people who have felt their pain. And for whatever reason, they weren't the ones that were being connected to each other. So I, this is where I see the hope. 